I'm Michelle DeMarzo. I'm the Curator of Education here at the Fairfield University Art Museum. And thank you for joining us for tonight's lecture on the art of Manuel Mendive, who's one of the artists featured in our current exhibition, Archives of Consciousness, Six Cuban Artists. And I am delighted to welcome our speaker, Dr. Barbara Martinez Ruiz, an art historian whose work focuses on Afro-Latin American and Caribbean visual culture, art, and aesthetics. Dr. Martinez Ruiz earned his BA from the University of Havana and his PhD from Yale University. And he is currently, as you can see from his title slide, uh, splitting his time. He is both Tanner Opperman Chair of African Art History in honor of Roy Sieber at Indiana University, and he is also a Senior Research Fellow in African and Afro-Latin American Arts at Trinity College University of Oxford. If that wasn't enough, he also holds the title of Honorary Professor in the Michaelis School of Fine Art at the University of Cape Town. So a very busy world traveler is our tonight's speaker. Uh, Dr. Martinez Ruiz has published numerous books and articles in both English and Spanish, including Green Machine, The Art of Carlos Luna, that came out in 2016, and Congo, Graphic Writing and Other Narratives of the Sign, that was published in both English and Spanish editions in 2012. And his current project, Engraving the World, Rupestrian Art and Migration in Central Africa, is forthcoming in 2020. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Martinez Ruiz. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming uh, today here. I, I, one of the things that worries me the most is the microphone. I try to kind of fight my fear to microphones. But I wanted to say thank you to uh, Fairfield University and the Art History Department and the museum for these kind invitations. And um, I want to also to extend uh, my thanks to Carrie Marks Weaver. Um, the director of the, the museum, um, Michelle De Marso, for being so kind and organizing the, the, this talk. This is maybe one of the, the things you think you will never will go back and, and kind of revisit. After I did an exhibition, a, a retrospective of Mandive, 60 years of his career, I, I thought I never had to go back and talk about his work, and I think it, this is kind of the first time I, I kind of go back and kind of pull my memories about the, why um, I think his work is relevant, why we should confront certain issues that, that haven't been answered until today about his work. Uh, something I try to uh, address through the exhibition is very different when, um, when you had to kind of write in a, a book or a catalog. And um, I think the, one of the most important issues in Mendive work is his African foundations. Is that we hyphenate Mendive as an artist that have, uh, uh, his work is uh, uh, related with an African, African culture or Afro African culture in the diaspora, specifically the Yoruba traditions is a very, one of the one of the fourth religion in, in Cuba. And I think that raised an int important question about how this uh, Yoruba culture and Yoruba aesthetic informs Mendive works and he's aware of and how he negotiate this uh, relationship with the Yoruba tradition, Yoruba cultural traits. And the second kind of layer is how, he, how aware he is with the Yoruba tradition back in Nigeria uh, Togo and Benin to so kind of set another another set of impossibilities in in his in his work. And we assume his quintessential art is that uh, his work is embedded with the specific African religion. And um, I just wanted to kind of show uh, a map of, of Nigeria uh, that is right now the location of a culture uh, Yoruba culture that go back to. Um, 500 BC is just to get a sense of how important is that culture. And, um, and I think a specific the ones uh, that have to do with the migrations uh, of um, transportations of uh, African slaves through African Nigeria and through the slave trade is come from a particular part of Edo. This Edo is the, um, was an important kingdom. And uh, the collide is pretty much in the border with what is Cameroon right now. 
And I think most of the Cuban uh, Yoruba tradition come from that particular region. So it's very different as Yoruba is so diverse. Um, and it's what we know about Yoruba culture, and uh, that is very different in the way Cuban understand Yoruba is a Yoruba culture in the way our historian, African art historian, uh, think about Yoruba as Yoruba civilization. It's kind of completely different arguments. Uh, what means civilization versus then only have a culture? And it's possible to talk about civilization in the context of the African diaspora. Um, but the Yoruba is famous for putting together um, a, metropol a, metropol a metropolis, a metropolis, a city, and uh, was a, a civilization that grew around um, urban centers. Um, and we have a lot of records uh, from 400 years of uh, understanding, try to uh, oral accounts or travel narratives to try to understand how this particular culture managed to create these incredible urban places. And this is just one of the photographs from 1668 of a, a view of a Yoruba civilization that is highlighted through the idea of having a metropolis like London or Paris or Amsterdam. And there's a lot of comparison between the metropolis of, of Benin with the metropolis of Amsterdam at the time. But the, all this uh, material culture we have from the Yoruba go back to um, 250 BC, it's called from Nak, is an archeological site in Nigeria, and they have this beautiful terracotta. That pretty much most of the feature you will find in Yoruba art, specific terracotta and the aesthetic of, of Yoruba art, they are kind of um, uh, related to this particular piece, the clary voice, uh, the design of the eyes, the body language and postures, that pretty much is the, the, the those pieces become kind of like a textbook for future understanding uh, implication of uh, um, this particular uh, visual aesthetic in future art among the Yoruba people. And, uh, and now we kind of show the a map that showed the, the traffic uh, of uh, humans uh, for 500 years between um, Africa, uh, Europe, and back into the Americas, that so, was so-called the transatlantic slave trade and uh, uh, the creation of the African diaspora. Um, and I, I think here they show the uh, specific numbers of uh, 11 to 10 million of um, Africans being uh, dislocated um, into the diaspora. And as you can see, pretty much the, the Spanish empire is around two and a half million people, in which uh, 300,000, 350,000 uh, being um, relocated in the context of Cuba. Um, and I think, as another example, that show a different comparison. So, uh, Numbers that are arriving to the diaspora, number leaving Africa. I think it's just a. I know you can see here, specific from West Africa, when uh, Yoruba culture is related and the incredible diversity of culture next to the Yoruba culture, and sometimes we take it as equal. But the Yoruba have a very distinctive understanding of uh, religions and um, uh, cosmogony of, of Yoruba religions, and they believe in in a creator God, an Almighty God that is responsible for every living microorganism in the world. But also, Yoruba believe in the pantheons of army and god and goddesses that have more responsibility in the everyday life. And also they believe in the importance of ancestor in, in that um, uh, structure. And, and the end is the world of the living that had to do with us as human living in a society. And, um, and I just want to show here a specific example of uh, deities, the, the ways, the names that have been changes uh, from Nigeria or from the context of Nigeria, West Africa and Benin to Brazil and Cuba and all the different, it's pretty much what you have is a perfect match in the, um, in the carry on the, the names. It's just changed its notation from Portuguese or French or Spanish. I changed the spelling, but it's pretty much it's the, same, the same name. But the, one of the, I think, is the, the second important issue in Mendibe work it had to do with how Yoruba people define art. And, um, and Yoruba have a particular concept that define not just the artistic practice, but also defined um, the entire um, attitude in life, the how they understand life and living. 
and call Ashe. And Ashe is translated as vitality or life force. And also they believe in another important uh, um, concept they call Iwa, uh, character. It, they believe in, in, in having good and bad character. It's something that affects your projections and understanding of life. And in Tutu, it's the translates as a mystic uh, coolness. And it had to do with uh, how you exchange yourself with other people, what we call generosity. And there's these three concepts that are very important in Yoruba culture. But I share, uh, Yoruba believe in order to understand art, in order to call something art, need to have a share inside. And this idea of a share is, is something that gives it power to the object. You have to feel it, but you have to understand how a share is negotiated into something that we call art. That is the, the rule number zero in Yoruba art. The kind of bring an interesting question is, Mandiba is aware of Ashe as an important element in defining an artistic practice, in the processes of making art. That is something I think I would like to address through the presentation. And, um, and I just want to give you a, a sense of how diverse is the pantheon, the army, and god and goddesses that kind of represent different aspects of uh, life. They um, have a specific intervention in different aspects of our livings and our behaviors as humans. It's kind of classified in a kind of arbitrary way just to get a sense that the god and goddesses, they are, they are more related, just for you to understand how diverse is that system, religious system. And also, Yoruba people believe in traditions. And, um, and traditions, I, I think, is something more like historical, so I think that happened in time. And a tradition have a very bad connotation for African art. A tradition is a synonymous of um, bad, have a negative implications. If something is traditional, uh, it's kind of associated with uh, witchcraft or black magic. It's the, which in the field of our history, it's trying to now renegotiate the use of those particular concepts. But traditional is the, that something is clear for an African practitioner. It's very different in the way we write about what means tradition in the context of our, our history, our African art. Um, and also, the idea of tradition uh, in Yoruba art is associated with particular mode of expression style. And also, they believe in ancient traditions as they go back before our humans' um, condition, before the creation of the urban center of the city. And also, they believe in tradition that can be passed from one generation to the next. Um, and, um, and also they believe in, um, Yoruba people believe every situation is subject of creating a new uh, conceptualization, a new understanding. You can, you, you, will be in, you will be able to create new traditions from, from the start on. Um, but the, one of the challenge for the exhibitions, I wanna, uh, and I also about Mendive work, I wanted to understand when everything started, the beginning of everything. And uh, maybe it's, it's kind of an art historian a curiosity. Um, I just didn't want it to jump into uh, the most significant um, work in, uh, in the 70s and in the 80s. I just wanted to go back. And, uh, and Mandiva studied in uh, San Alejandro Academy. And also I studied in the same place. And that's we have a kind of connection uh, that way. And we both came from um, uh, working class, black neighborhood, or African descendant neighborhood. There's another connection. Um, and uh, and uh, you can see uh, Mendive, this is uh, the first drawing from the left, it's from 1952, won a prize uh, drawing competition in Japan. Uh, Mendive submit as a kid. And later you can see all the work, and this uh, curiosity for religion was something day, from day one in Mendive work. And uh, you can see the uh, uh, depiction of Jesus Christ was an important um, and current um, uh, themes in his work in his early time. All people of importance, like his grandmother, or important writers, um, uncles and aunties. And um, what I want to kind of to show uh, um, kind of to you is the, not just as someone from as a kid is able to have this kind of naive drawing on the left, but also he can kind of develop a different kind of, assess a different kind of styles like uh, still, still life, like flowers, uh, archetype, religious archetype, himself as a portrait, 
and, and other people, including his own neighborhood. And you can see the range of themes uh, he's uh, kind of informing his own curiosity as an artist uh, until 1963. Um, and this is the kind of displays of the early drawings uh, front from Mendive. Um, but this is what I consider the first, first, first work of Mendive. And it's uh, uh, beginning of the 1960s. Uh, you can see uh, he's using organic material. He's using um, recycled material. He's using things that have been thrown out, specifically like uh, sacks, uh, rattan, um, blankets, and um, sheets that people use everyday life. And you can see the, Moses' work in the early, in the early um, the two on the left, on the early 60s, he did in collaboration with uh, family members. But the, I think the most important feature here is the, he tried to align uh, human bodies. He tried to create a new type of embodiment uh, that could be human or could be something else. And you can see these uh, um, hybridities that kind of insisted in those hybridities of those creatures that are not easy to recognize. They are kind of uncanny uh, compositions. Or you can see these faces with eyes or one single eyes, and they are so and stitched into those material. But also, this kind of work at the beginning, uh, Mandiba used to like to have the impact of time. He used to make a drawing or stitch those figures, and he had to leave it on the floor, and the people had to kind of walk on top or get rains or salty water. And the impact of nature was important for him, the, the creating a new meaning into this object. Um, but the Mandiba is the kind of artist that decided to explore other things that other people, other Cuban artists didn't explore, like performance art. He's, he was the first one in Cuba who started doing performing kind of publicly without apologizing, so without asking for authorization. Um, also, he was exploring with uh, terracotta. But they just wanted to show you one example of uh, terracotta from, you can see on the left. It's a terracotta from um, Yoruba, um, Yoruba piece from Ife. Ife used to be the uh, state um, um, city among the Yoruba people. This is 200 BC. And there is an association with the Yoruba, in general to African art and Yoruba art. They, they are not quick, they are not able to uh, understand realism. But you can see you cannot be more realistic than the pieces on the left. And now it's one of the assumptions we have about African art has kind of been kind of destroyed in one second. And you have other, other terracotta that are designed as a religious object for libations or refreshness of uh, the person. The idea of a mystical coolness is to bring that kind of confidence and freshness is in the water that is whole in the piece on the middle. Um, and on the right, this is the kind of a Cuban understanding of uh, this ceramic by replacing by um, porcelain from China. And I think we have uh, modernity kind of plays a different role in the way that African people reconstructed their own tradition in the diaspora. But nevertheless, the idea is still the same. The conceptual framework is still the same. So the materiality, uh, they are very different. And this is what Mendive decided to do. Uh, Mendive, um, I think Mendive's uh, art is defined by his desire to tell stories. He's, he's a storyteller from day one. And that's why we saw at the early work is the desire to look for uh, embodiment that they can use to tell a story, to narrate something. That he's looking for archetype of human conditions. Could be from God or um, a, a, symbol, a single mortar. And what we have here is the a kind of terracotta tradition he did in Italy. He did 20 something terracotta in Italy. Um, he is now in the interesting crossroad in which uh, this, his fascination and love for Western art played an important role in his own training. And he tried to kind of find a way to negotiate his, his understanding of all those type of representation in Greek and Roman antiquity and how he can kind of replace that back into his own religious belief. And, um, and here is the themes that had to do with water, different kind of water, fresh water, salty water, these important themes uh, representing archetype like goddesses like Yemaya, 
or, or Schoen, is this become an important fascination in his work because they didn't have in the work of art just, uh, uh, those kind of images that have been produced at that time. He's now pushing a new boundaries in Q and R. He creating a morphology. He creating an embodiment that allowed to every single person, not just artists, every single person in particular, to understand how to understand those uh, deities, and it's now. It's just this, 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 the challenge has moved to another level. Like pretty much when you, when you see all Mandiba work in the early time, it was rejected by re practitioners because they, they thought his work as a transgression of uh, the norm. Um, you had to wait 15, 20 years in his practice to, when he kind of trained people to understand what he wanted to do. Um, it's just uh, examples of this terracotta. And, um, and uh, you can see he's uh, looking for Themes that have to do with water, like mummy water, a spirit that represent water. They are um, pretty much you will find in every society in Africa. Now he's not specific about Afro-Cuban religion. He wanted to create an art that speak to all African traditions. It's the early um, um, particular practice. Or he think about specific uh, signifiers, or, um, symbols that people related to a um, uh, um, specific deity using representation of fish or um, and animals uh, they are related to emblematic of the and it's very simplistic at, the, at that sense but what we have here is the archetype of a uh, woman uh, on the the roles of uh, women in cuban society i think is what he's kind of playing around and uh, when you think about diane in the, in a antiquity and how diane can be replaced by the power of a woman in Afro-Cuban society, not just being initiated a woman like, uh, you think about the deities like Oshun, what people associate in Cuba with money, and Oshun is associated with uh, confidence, is a confident woman, so know herself. And, and, and now, we have a, a Mendiba realized they have a problem. There is a two understanding of Afro-Cuban themes, one that, that only resonates in the context of uh, popular culture. And the second one is the one that operate for people who already know the religions. And those differences, they are important for Mendiva work. And sometimes they contradict each other. Um, and his, his work is kind of in the middle of these contradictions. What, how popular culture imagine the religion is different from how the practitioner leave the religion and understand those meaning. And uh, his early work is what I call uh, mythological paintings. And this is the paintings we might know from Mandiba. This is what made him popular. And most of his paintings, they are a straight translation of a religious archetype. He's depicting God and goddesses from the Yoruba pantheon. It's something that most of the Afro-Cuban practitioner didn't like it because the the Yoruba tradition in Cuba have their own visual culture that is not, uh, that has to do anything with being trained in the fine art academy and, and being there for many, many years. You don't have to go to that school to be fully versed in that tradition. That is one, one of the one problem. And they have a, a professional artist who's kind of reflecting into a tradition that is not asking for authorization to the fine art academy to be accepted. And I think that is the kind of tension. But nevertheless, uh, Mendiba is seeking, he's looking, searching for a language. That is what I think. Uh, Mendiba is uh, he's searching for a language that he hasn't even found yet until today that would allow him to understand that the Yoruba experience, the religious experience. That religious experience is, is complicated, it's messy. And, and because Cuba is in a very complicated historical crossroad, multiple culture, multiple temporalities. They come together, political, a very dysfunctional place, uh, as a political space. That you, all of these, the, the, he has to negotiate uh, at the real time. It's almost like building an airplane when he's flying the airplane. Um, and uh, what I, I create a series of uh, categories that allow me to understand Mendiba work. And, um, and the, fir the first one had to do more with this idea of a Mendiba as a narrator. Mendiba, the one who wanted to tell the story. And I use the concept of visual poetry. And, um, and the idea of poetry makes, uh, for me is because poetry is not tangible. It requires a lot of imaginations. And I think it's that is the reason. It's maybe Plato believed poetry is more precise than anything else. But I think it's, it's opposite to Mendiva in the way I use it here. But 
this is a, the first, 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 first um, um, known um, uh, work from Bendive from early 60s, after the experimentation I showed from the beginning. This is used now, he's a professional artist, he has an exhibition in an important gallery, and he using recycled material. Windows, doors, wall panels, floor panels, um, in which the life of these materials is being reflected in the surface of this object. Now, that is the first thing, he's choosing that. And also, this is the time in Mendive also come into realization how Yoruba religion uh, will play an important role in his life. He have an accident, he, that there is an expression in Cuba when the doctor cannot find solution for your problem, he said you had to walk, and this is what he did. And the idea of walking is to find him for solution for your current situation. And he became a member of a Yoruba, initiated in a Yoruba religion, and now he has a relationship with a religion that doesn't come straight from the family history, because the family used to be Catholic. He's coming to religion through a sense of trauma. Um, um, that, that is, I think, it's, it's important for, for, for me to understand him and deeper work. Um, and as there is a temporality in addressing his own psychology, his own suffering at that time. And now you have Mendive who is using art as a way he understands his new spiritual awakening, his uh, renaissance as a, as, a, as a new kind of individual after this accident. And he tried to also back into this archetype of a religion and as a way in which he can negotiate his way in, in a understanding how this religion functions and how it will define his own, um, his own life. But the... Um, and this is, the, for me, I consider it the best Mendiva work, maybe it's in my own personal choice. Um, um, this particular piece on title, but it's, it's not really on title, is a representation of uh, the god Ogun. Uh, Ogun in Yoruba tradition is the god of a cutting age, is the god of technology, is the god of labor and making. And everything that had to do with labor is in the hands of the cleverness of this God. And um, that is what he's responsible for, computer, everything that, you know, give uh, uh, meaning to a modern life. He's, he's the God of modernity, if you want to think it that way. But Mendive tried to understand all the different interpretation as understanding of uh, what Ogun means, that in the popular imaginary is associated with a grumpy, roughy, old man that is um, angry all the time, angry at everyone. He's subject of uh, betrayed. Um, he cannot control himself. And, and violent is his final, that is the way it's being portrayed. And dirtiness is associated, it's one of the most important attributes in the popular imaginary. That is completely opposite what Ogun is, at the end of the day, for Yoruba uh, um, moral philosophy. And now you can see he's like depicting, Ogun is depicted as a hill, and he's placing a house on the top of the hill as the altar. He's creating a new iconography by relying on his early representation in the imagination of the people how to depict or how to associate Ogun. Ogun is the mountain, is the hill. Ogun also could be a tree that's associated with the snake and also rain. And Ogun is this um, old man with have a, a, um, a dress, a traditional dress like a, like a, like a priest. And this is a, now he's looking, you see here multiple representation of the same theme that kind of depicted in a, in a fractal way that I think is the concept we use in African art, fractal instead of a tautology. Um, and there is a significant difference between the two. And um, here, what I try to show you here from day one in early work from Mendive, he wanted to tell the story and how he wanted to tell the story. He using that this, uh, serious, uh, he created those banners. And each understanding of Ogun is displayed in each of the section he put together as a whole. Now we have a sense of surreality, tell the story through time. And the fragmentation we can use as a way to understand the, the, the time, the organization of time, progression of time. And the idea can be deployed on particular space. 
There's another example from also Ogun, this is the sand deities. So on the left, we have maybe the first depiction of Ogun in Cuban art. Um, and as maybe driving these images from maybe a, a coffee table book of African art, he, um, the few from the early uh, 60s and 70s. And on the right is all the association in the popular imaginary about Ogun, violence, uh, this abusive husband, abusive man who beat his wife, was on the right. And now he's uh, colliding these two understanding of Ogun, Ogun as a portrait of a, of a deity that you had to understand for his own aesthetic, his beauty, as, as his embodiment on the left. And on the right is the opposite to that, is how the people related in the popular imagination, in the popular space. And that is the goon, is the, the collision of these two understandings. That is what made his work so relevant to me, because it's bringing that contradiction embedded into a Cuban society, into this um, hybrid space, uh, into this uh, syncretized space, if you want to use those fancy words. And, um, the, the last from that series is that called Endoko. And is, uh, Endoko is the piece that has, is related to a uh, concept of love and the idea of love. And again, so you can see now he using not just the, the idea of these banners to display a different understanding, but also he using repetition of a similar thing to kind of close the story. Um, the idea of a couple as a love uh, signify love on the top also is on the bottom. And you have this love as a way to compress the story in the middle. Because the only way you will understand the love is by understanding what happened in the middle. And this is the Mendive understanding of this the concept of love. And it also has to do with love as, uh, as something already happening in his life. This is a painting Mendive did on the floor. He wasn't able to move after the accident. And he wasn't able to move after the accident, and he was, um, the piece of uh, wood was on the floor, and he had to paint from the top all the way to the bottom of the painting until he finished, because he was kind of crawling up back into the painting for the accident. But here, you can see the, the Mendive negotiation of the archetype of uh, Oshun, that in the mythology, Yoruba is the wife of, uh, uh, the lover of Chang'o. It's that, uh, love is the unpredictable, um, and also raise other issues about the uh, love that is outside a married couple. It's interesting, and in, in he's kind of bringing that into. And the final um, cardinal love on uh, reproduction and the end, the idea of uh, continuity of a human race as, the, as on the one on the button. And, and later, so when I ask, he said, uh, I try to get the sense of what represents the relationship between animals and human on the right, and he used animals to create different metaphor or different qualification of love. He's kind of quantifying love experience that had to do with him and love experience that had to do with becoming that religious person, his uh, spiritual um, uh, awakening. Um, but the, when you move into um, the 80s, after the 70s uh, uh, post-impressionist, um, work that we saw before with the dots. That also something he's still in his work until today. And uh, we can see three important elements that Mendiba used as, a, as a resources to, uh, to build his own visual language in his looking for that language. And one is flying, the idea of flying hoverings of uh, images that you will find in, uh, pretty much in all his work from day one. And the idea of hybridity, this creating new entities. Uh, they could be human, they can be monsters. And um, iconic narratives now, he combined to, to different elements to try to tell a story. And sometimes a story they, had, they are related to a specific um, oral account that people knows and I tells. Or it could be a, a fragment from the Pataki, is one of the um, uh, important uh, uh, Yoruba literature tradition. Um, but have pretty much all the morals, archetypes um, um, of a Yoruba religion that are embedded in that body of writing. And now he has a, a, a way in which those narratives that come now into a different way in, a, in the language in which he can empower to tell those kind of story. And, um, but this is the basic conversation with Mendive, the the fascination, the specific reference uh, that he used, like flying or hovering, that came from important uh, masters, artists that plays an important role in Mendive work. Um, 
and specifically, um, 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 what is the, I forget his name now, um, on the right, William Blake, I'm sorry, uh, William Blake, the two images on the right, and there is an exhibition at Tate, uh, um, I finished tomorrow, on William Blake uh, and the Bible. It's an amazing show, you should go and see it. And, well, you have an artist that also want to represent religious archetype, and this is what he's choosing, William Blake, in with hovering and flying. It's one of the most important themes in William Blake. Um, interesting enough, William Blake did a lot of images of uh, um, uh, exploitation and the violence uh, toward the human um, African body. There's something that Mandiba doesn't do not use in his work. It's, uh, and the um, idea of hybridity that also he used to signify that relationship between human and the deity, I think is what is underlined the, his, his work. And um, here, hybridity is you know, based in a, um, a specific artist that has been referred in conversation with him, and Blake is still pretty much is one of the uh, main uh, artists that, that have informed his, his work. And uh, you can see, uh, a specific depiction had to do with the, the psychological disposition toward the religious archetype or, or God and the energy wanna. And uh, here you kind of see a kind of map of all of the different uh, themes and concepts that Mendeba used uh, to reshape his own work, but now not in relation to the Bible, in relation to Christianity, it's in relation to space in which Christianity plays an important role, but also is in conversation with African traditions. And that is what he had to find a way to negotiate those uh, translations. And I think, I don't like translation. I like more shifting. But anyway, the translation sounds like a, uh, something you will understand. Um, but here I wanted to show you uh, images from Mandiba, pretty much from 1987. You can see, I realized Mendebe was making painting out of style. So if you, you know, the, most of the art historian has this fascination to talk about Mendebe of the 70s and the 80s. But I find out Mendebe, through all his work, he started making painting from style from 200, 20 years before. And then, and then somehow he's like unfinished painting, so unfinished project he's doing in 2000. And it's just one, it's the one on the, uh, 1989. And it's like been seen as a new painting now in 2000, but it's just based in the painting he did in the, in the late 80s. And as you can see pretty much from 1992 to 1990, um, uh, 2092. But the, this is, was the title I used for um, Mandiva exhibitions and the catalog I wrote, because it had to do with the um, impossibilities. I think it's the, the way I see. Uh, we wanted to know everything about Mandiwe, and I realized we cannot know everything about Mandiwe, and that is an impossibility. Um, I, I can maybe have an approximation to Mandiwe works. That is what I try to do. Um, and at Mandiwe have this uh, paper on, on cloth, what we call applique, and um, of fabric, if you want to, is another term. And what you can see, sewing, cutting, pasting on, and also it's all three-dimensional. He's not making any discrimination in the kind of uh, objects and material he wanted to use in his frame. And uh, you can see the one from 1965. And the one we have in the gallery is similar to the one from 2005. Those are more aligned with the one from uh, 1965. But also, this is the one he produced in 2010. And this is a tapestry I produced for Mendive in a photo exhibition in Los Angeles. And, and we made it a, a jacquard loom. And we recreate 500 color from Mendive painting. And I, I think you wanted to understand that jacquard loom, you only can have three colors. Every color you see in the tapestry here. And it's kind of continue of Mendeba work. And this is just the work from Mendeba from that time, uh, from, from 2010, in which he go back to these typical themes in his work, um, flying figures. But now flying figures had to be more precise. And also he now looking for a different way to engage the audience. And now the idea of uh, Ashe, 
that had to do more with the process of cognition. So that may, may be the way I kind of frame how he bring a chair into the creative process. This piece is like, you have the three, the three sections, but the one, the number three, that cloth you had to lift it up, and there is an image that only can be understood by unveiling what is behind that cloth. And the completion of uh, understanding of this painting, the sight, is, is by unveiling the mystery behind that painting, that physical actions of having access to a private space of a painting, I can maybe translate as a way he's understanding what I share mean. That kind of animation that had to be there for understanding. And, um, and here you can see the progression from he used a specific technique in Western art to kind of empower his own tradition. But now he, now he brings a specific understanding of hybridity, uh, the visual language we, we know from him. Also, he wanted to still going back to how to depict those archetypes, religious archetypes, like Olokun, like is the bottom of the ocean, how he's looking for a way in which to represent the, the bottom of the oceans that is associated with the great art in the context of Yoruba, uh, moral philosophy in the context of contemporary art. And now he had to give, give a new body to that deity, so it's the one in the middle. Or how you depict the world of the living, the world in which we inhabit, and we have our mysteries and problems and happiness. And he's now using a new way in which he can engage the audience to continue following his um, search for this language that can be used to map out this new psychological uh, crossroad. And uh, I just wanted to show one of the things, like uh, um, most of the people who study African art, they think that Yoruba art do not have a graphic writing system. This is an example of graphic writing system from Nigeria the Yoruba people. And this writing is made out of um, so drawings they made on the grounds that are still in use until today. And uh, most of the uh, practitioners in Cuba, they don't believe that Yoruba has this graphic writing system. Um, I just want to just bring back into the, and you can see also important signifier that Mandiba used in his work, like the fans, the idea of coolness, the idea of confidence in Yoruba art, that how he kind of translate into his own, into his own practice. Again, another example from Yoruba graphic writing system that kind of simultaneously you know, taking place in Africa at the same time. You have Yoruba people also have their own graphic expressions. In a similar way, Mandiba is looking for that language. That's what I try to say. Just an example of a religious space in Cuba that's very different from what Mandiba is doing translating through his paintings or it could be uh, uh, the space of a deity could be a crossroad or being by the ocean or an altar. And now we back into Mendiva in which he's transforming a three-dimensional experience, sonic kinetic into something flat as a painting. And how it's possible through the language of a painting and the limitation of a painting to uh, represent something complex like this um, I showed before in the Yoruba tradition. So, so I think it's that negotiation is what is still relevant for Mandive. That is what performing. This is an example from the Jacquard Loom from Mandive. I produced uh, Magnolia 2012. I did two of the tapestry. And I've given a sense of the detail that kind of recreate the same procedure Mandive followed through his own work. Um, and this is just samples from the exhibitions. Um, but the, when you think about uh, very specific themes, uh, like depictions of a deity like Eshu or Eledba, is the, the, the deity of a crossroads of a, a consciousness or truth. And, um, and it's depicted in many different ways in the Yoruba. Here, what we see, there are anthropomorphic figures. Um, and this is an example from the diaspora that's made out of clays that is translating Cuba as a child. That's the way also Mendiba used it in his painting. Um, or you think about deities that represent the human soul. That is, this is the Yoruba tradition in the religion. Um, this is also in Nigeria. They have the bird on the top to signify the human soul, the idea of ability to fly, to send the messages back to um, God. Um, and the graphic writing system that kind of repeat the same depiction I saw from before or depicting Ogun with the rifles of those man, those heels of stones on the left, or the cauldrons in the Yoruba traditions, 
or when you, uh, Yoruba tradition, you represent the Ochozi, the god of uh, hunting or realizations or uh, directions, the arrow and the, and the bow. And this is Mendive respond to that. Now he brings in the independent individual god and goddesses. They have a specific uh, iconography, independent iconography in the Yoruba tradition. And he brings them back into a system. Now he creates a new way of understanding a system that allowed to bring different gods and goddesses in the sand, in a conversation, in an interaction between them. And here you can see how he related to Ledba. Now he's represented as a child, as a baby on the left, a small child. And I repeat it again. Um, Ogun is the, with the feathers and the dots. And uh, Ochozi on Oshun uh, with the feather on the top. And there's a four dates it's kind of bring together in one ensemble. There's something never happened before in, in Afro-Cuban art. Now he's having a conversation. The Yoruba religion of making a statement is uh, you have to understand as a system rather than individual deities. Um, and he have also problems of uh, struggling with specific depictions that are important, like Shango is represent is a god of fire or lining, so also associated with uh, fertilizing the earth and uh, rain. That is uh, in the Yoruba religion, and also Shango is not subject of representation. Is that natural phenomenon at the end of the day. Um, and I'm, this is an example of the depiction of Shango in a, um, as a god of thunder and lining. And this is a few examples from classic historical Yoruba art in which the issues of gender plays an important role. Now Shango, the archetype of the macho, um, Cuban macho, strong, uh, beautiful, now is a woman. It's not just a woman, also is a mother. And in a Yoruba um, iconography, that also is completely uh, uh, clash with the way Cuba understands that particular um, archetype. Um, and this is um, uh, Mendive respond. He's bringing the symbols, uh, the emblem of uh, Shango, and place all the stories, all the contradiction, inside the frame of a double axe. And um, Shango is uh, all the different interpretation over time. And just to finish. Um, I just wanted to show something that is very important for Yoruba art is bronzes. Um, this is just an example of a uh, no naive uh, um, art uh, uh, from the Yoruba people, the 14th, uh, 13th, 14th century. If it's a, realism plays an important role in those kind of bronzes and, and, and coppers. And this is another example we know from the British Museum is now in contestation by the one of being repatriated back to Africa. Um, and this, this, you think about uh, depictions, they are enhanced and they have to be recognized in a society. It's about a queen mother or it's about a wife. And portraits play an important role in, in understanding uh, what this image represents. And um, you cannot be more far, more close to realism uh, than those images. Um, you just kind of bring a little bit of flavor to uh, this primitive uh, Yoruba art that we know is not. Uh, the only person can rival that is uh, Chuck Close. But anyway, um, those are another example of Yoruba art reflecting into uh, cultural encounter. When Portuguese arrived to Yoruba land in, uh, in the 16th century, the Yoruba art find a way to depict uh, those uh, emblems of power, a Portuguese a beer person. Not because uh, he's a foreigner, it's because he represents certain kind of power that had to do with exchange. This is a moment of encounter. Um, and it's the Yoruba is reflecting on those historical phenomena that you want to see that way. This is Mendive response to uh, bronzes, uh, Yoruba bronzes. Now, what well, you can see, he's animating his representation from before, now making more two dimensional. That is what, uh, and this is the way I display In order to animate that, I want to use those mirror in the back, and you feel like you're in an army of bronzes. Kind of bringing back this idea of Ache is something that is overwhelming, it's almost in incomprehensible. Um, and the final word from Mendive, that's something he rejected until today, when people call soft sculpture. There is a tradition of softness, of recycling material in Yoruba art called Ale. And um, in Western art we call it Arte Povera, but it's a, a famous movement in the 70s in Italy. And this is the work Mendive uh, kind of related to that as a garbage. 
And I, I think it was important for me to kind of bring those up you know, into the context of uh, understanding what Mendiva wanted to do. Because now they are not bidimensional, they are fully embodiment. They are alive in the context of the gallery. You had to wander around then. They are two-dimensional, they are moving around. And, and hybridity and, and, and hovering and floating also still in those images when the way he displays them, maybe two times throughout his career. And um, just an example how I did in the gallery. And uh, the final one is like, he did those pieces before with this performance. And what I did, I took all this mask um, and I show in the gallery like uh, the, the mask and the self sculpture that are looking to themselves. It's more like introspections. The only way Mendiva will understand what he want is by looking to inside himself. But I ask him Mendiva work to look to themselves into a uh, projection. And, and maybe it's like a metaphor of that work, they have a life of themselves. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I went a little bit more than the time, but I, yeah. that is my assessment of Mandiva, Mandiva work. I think we have time for just a couple questions. Um, in the beginning, you showed us a couple that you said were made out of recycled materials, and they were uh, they had been on the floor and stepped on. And then later, you showed us after he was in his accident, he was working on another one that was on the, the floor. The, the, wood, the wood panel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you said he had to kind of crawl backwards. And I was wondering if they have they ever been displayed on the floor, and or have you ever seen them on the no, floor? No, the, the, you feel like they have different meanings. The two, the two, the only time those pieces have been on display is that when I did the exhibition at the African American Museum in, in Los Angeles, um, next to the, the Space Museum, I think is the, the the one, the first one, the three pieces that are stitched out and cut um, cloth, and the panels are only there are only two that survived at that time. One is in the National Museum in Cuba, and is 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 mounted on the wall. And this one is on Mendive, uh, Mendive House. And uh, he, I think he, he doesn't think this work is important. That is my, my observation. I think maybe because it had to do with a particular moment, he's changing as a person. He, his spiritual dimension is, is changing. He's, he's, in, he's like kind of discovering himself. But he's not discovering himself because he wanted. I think he's been forced by the accident. I think is that when I ask you how you painted, they say, I, I couldn't move. But if I start painting from the bottom, I, I will destroy my own work. It was like a technical decision to start painting from the top to the, to the. I said, but it looked like a, almost like a baptism. If you think about the idea of painting, it's like you are rubbing yourself to, on, the to, on the surface of the wood and the painting is all the chemical using at the time, you know, it's like getting under the water. I was, what I was thinking, kind of in religious, uh, kind of religious experience that could be, could be translated to that moment. But that's it is the only, the only, the one at the National Museum is the only on displays. Um, now it's more people that are paying attention to this particular work. Um, and I, I don't, I, I think I don't know why. I think it's the, the people ignore this, this, particular piece, because uh, he's in an in a, in a interesting moment in which he realized there are two understandings of religion that he doesn't understand. He get all this notebook when you become, when you initiate it, they give you a notebook in which you have to write, it's like a memoir. You learn from someone else who tell you all the Monday, the, the exegesis and the moral philosophy you, every day, and you're writing down your understanding, you have to read all the texts from other people. But he, what he remembered from his own personal life from in the street and the people talk about religion is completely different. And he's in the middle of this negotiation and, and crisis in a way. And he brings that into the painting. That for me is a contradiction that's still onto today in Cuban society. That what I think is relevant to those paintings more than anything else. Any, any other complaints? <laughs> So obviously it's a very individualized style, as you showed us so well. Did the Cuban art schools 
encourage abstraction and then finding one's own style, or was he trained in a more academic? He was trained most on academic in San Alejandro. Uh, you had to copy the massive Rembrandt design. I used to love copy Rembrandt and all this kind of thing. But then I think in the, in the way the San Alejandro Academy functions until today is, is in the same way like any other school. There is no way in which you can bring the visual culture of Afro-Cuban religions, the plural, the four religion, into the curriculum. That's one of the problems. And, uh, and he also, he was, the way he was framed as, as an artist in the 70s it was like this in the, this ex exotic um, guy who wanted to live outside the city. He doesn't want to live in Havana. He, have a, he lives in the farm. And his entire work is about the farm. He's, he thinks he's close to God on the goddesses. And there is a, lot, a little bit of eccentrism that uh, cultural institution in Cuba used in a way to frame him. Also to create a sense of value. He's not a real He's not a good artist because he's, doing with, he's dealing with popular culture. That was the, what was there. But in the late 70s, uh, was the Havana, Cuba, the Ministry of Culture created an institution for only for artists from the 70s. And he's invited back into that to be one of the artists in that, in that institution. That is still uh, in Cuba. They only work, they only exhibit, they only promote artists from that, from that time. And that create now, the government creates a generation of artists or institutions that work with specific, a specific generation. And you feel comfortable in working with those particular curators and that particular institutions. And that's something that happened. Also, so Mandiba is struggling with other demons if you wanted to, you know, his, the issues of sexuality, they are visible in his work. Something he hasn't addressed until today. And it's, it's, it's open knowledge for everyone. And it could be very good for, for Cuban artists to someone like him to, to really to address those issues. It hasn't until today. And I think that is a, another, you have an artist that he, he doesn't, he cannot, I think he's, I think he's not ready, society is not ready to understand his own identity in, in this. He preferred to be seen as this naive artist. He's playing, he's playing with a naive work. Until you start kind of digging in his work, you see it's more complex than being naive, he's kind of manipulating that for a very specific goal that, that is still, still relevant for his work today. And then, who, who else? I just have a question. Given, um, does he see any of his works as, as having a possibly a liturgical function given his Christian background or some of the symbolism, the symbolism of the pieces? Do any of them, or? No, is it just a personal? Just personal. It's just personal. When you he ask me, see it as that a, a viewer, the audience would have any sort of response to the work, like say, you know, bronze sculpture where you lift up, you reveal, you know, the cover of the head, the whole experience. No, he doesn't. I think it's when you ask. It's very it's difficult to get to extract something from him. But when you ask, what do you think about? It? What do you mean with this? Why you have a rooster? He. Oh, because I like it. But you know it's not because he likes it. He's making a specific decision and he has to go around. And he says, ah, well, you know, the, the red rooster is associated with a particular deity. And when you sacrifice, it all has to be red, not the white one. White. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know this. Uh, but you know he knows. He want you, he don't want you to start asking for a specific meaning because he thinks that the, his work should be open to multiple interpretations. And I think it's that, that has to do with the idea of the music. He, I mentioned before, he liked classical music because it inspired him, it moved him. It doesn't mean invalidate his understanding of African meaning in his work. That is a procedure that had to do with the creative you know, impulse. And, 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 and it is very clear that and when you think you're questioning that as something that could devalue his work, he get very defensive. And he said, no, 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 it's whatever you think, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's an open interpretation. The art is, is universal. This is the kind of words he used all the time, because he doesn't want to be confronted. Also, he faced those kind of rejections in the early work. Most of the practitioners, they didn't like the depiction of the deities. Mm -hmm. um, now we have to kind of get deeper. Why they don't want to, uh, that kind of depicting, the depiction from the deity coming from him, and now you have to understand who is Mendive. He's, he's a 
uh, a gay man in Cuba depicting a religion. And Cuba have a society have a problem with that issues. And now this is a, what we don't want to talk about, but that is in the middle. Why he's rejected, it doesn't have to do with the actual depiction itself, with what that means in Cuba and the prejudice in Cuban society. And he's in the middle of that conversation. He never talked about it. He, no one wanted to address the issue, but they are there. There are many other, and I know it happened just with him, it happened with writer, Cuban writers. They, they kind of create, masquerade the entire practice because they, had, they wanted to be acceptable by society. Mendiva used the Biennales as a way to get attention, and no one could compete with him. At the Havana Biennale, he organized a party at his farm, and all the foreigners that went to Cuba end up at his house. The Cuban government couldn't compete. He was more clever than the government couldn't compete with him. And he get the international connection that the government couldn't provide him. Because he was, at the end, this artist that, you know, he is in the 70s, he's important. Now we call the master. Oh, master. But that wasn't before. That wasn't before. And of course, we had to be responsible in telling those kind of story. Because now he's a superhero, but we have to acknowledge all the difficulties and the suffering he went through in his life. Even now he has a comfortable life and enjoying a good moment as an artist, but we had we had to be responsible with that. And I think what is what happened at the end, not because they didn't want him to depict Oshun or Shango, it's because who he was. He wasn't, you know, a stray man and uh, people have issues with him at the time as a person. Thank you. Stop there. Thank you so much.